ben op reis door een land in verwarring. Tien jaar geleden werden de Verenigde Staten in hun hart getroffen door de aanslagen van 11 september. Sindsdien is het land onafgebroken in oorlog tegen het terrorisme. In Irak en vooral nu nog in Afghanistan. Twee jaar geleden kwam daar ook nog eens de financiële crisis bovenop... die overal in het land zijn sporen heeft nagelaten. In datzelfde jaar werd Barack Obama uit Chicago gekozen als nieuwe president van Amerika. Hallo Chicago! Het was de tijd van hoop, verwachting en verzoening. Maar de presidentsverkiezingen van volgend jaar zetten de tegenstellingen op scherp. De tol van de oorlogen in Irak en Afghanistan weegt zwaar. De vierde aflevering van mijn reis door Amerika brengt me in Colorado Springs, ook wel de legerhoofdstad van Amerika genoemd. En hier wordt getraind, getraind voor de oorlog. I love my country. Uh, you know, in 2001, you know, everything changed on September 11th. And uh, you know, I think uh, just uh, the American people, a lot of people stepped up. We uh, we went to defend our country and def you know defend the world and defend what's right. The ultimate price is death, and you know it's 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 sad, but you realize going into it that this is what you signed up for. Dit soort jongens worden uitgezonden, bijvoorbeeld naar Afghanistan. En de meesten komen gelukkig levend terug. Maar zelfs als je levend terugkomt, wil het nog niet zeggen dat het goed met je gaat. from fifth group, the special forces group, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what to do with it all. Mm -hmm. um, regular army doesn't necessarily do all of this, um, and it's very expensive. So I had to, instead of putting it in the garage, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, put it mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. Um, I don't want it to look like a shrine, mm -hmm. but it probably does. His teammates actually put the collages and the pictures together, um, which is very special. Of course. Um, and of course, you know, the flag and the flag case. He was a medic, so he was always carting around a lot of medical supplies and equipment. He had actually gotten out of the Army. Okay. Um, he did his first enlistment of six years, and he um, said, Mom, enough. I've had enough. Um, and so he got out. And then about six months later, he re-enlisted. He missed his teammates. He missed the lifestyle. Um, so he went back in in September of 07, deployed in October, and was killed in January. Yep. This is his beret. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, special Forces symbol to liberate the oppressed. This is his his journal, a couple of poems to his mom. Do you often read it? Yes, I do. Does it help you? Um, it helps to know. Um, 
that he thought of me. Mm -hmm. um, Justin Miller is een van de ruim 6000 Amerikaanse militairen die tijdens de oorlogen in Irak en Afghanistan om het leven is gekomen. Zijn moeder Estelin en Pat O'Kane Tromley zijn de drijvende krachten in Colorado Springs achter de Gold Star Mothers. Een landelijke organisatie die zich inzet voor nabestaanden van gesneuvelde militairen. His dream was to fly. And um, there are not a lot of pilot slots in the U.S. Air Force, for example, and he was an Air Force ROTC. So um, when he told me he got Pensacola, I told him he was wrong because Pensacola is a Navy base. And I said, Tom, 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 you've got this all wrong. And he said, no, Mom, that's where the strike fighters go. And that's when I learned that he'd been chosen to try out for the elite slots of the strike fighters. Justin liked the idea that he would be doing something for America. He um, was passionate about all the good things we have here. Um, and he knew that if it was ever in question that someone was trying to harm us, he would be the first one um, to stand up. And, and so he did. He was... Um uh, deployed to Bagram Airfield in Bagram, Afghanistan. What did that mean to him? It meant to him, he, he said, Mom, I'm finally going to get to use all the training I've had for four years. And he didn't talk about it without risk at all, but he, he was anxious to really serve his country. What happened to Justin in Iraq? He um, was the driver of a Humvee, and it hit a, an IED. Uh, IED. Mm -hmm. These terrible IEDs. Terrible. Terrible. Um, he was killed instantly, um, ejected from the Humvee. The doorbell rang, and the first thing I saw was an Air Force uniform with the gleaming silver cross, and I knew. Yeah, you know, the unthinkable and unbelievable had happened. Um, you immediately knew that he was killed. Because he, you know, he had told me, you know, you know, that if we go down, Mom, we will not survive. My son Nathan called me from Iraq later the, that day. Um, and he said um, just a couple of things. And he said, Mother, I have Justin. And I'm bringing him home. And he did. Don't pay the highest price for the freedom of the Afghan people. What does freedom mean to you? I think I just believe even more passionately in it. Um, freedom, I know keenly, is not free. It comes, has come in my, our family's case with a very dear price. But I also know he was doing what he loved to do. I believe, and he believed, in the mission that he was doing. Um, he felt um, there was a direct threat to us, to America, by the terrorist. Um, and he would say, that's the price you pay. So as a mother, though, um, I can't say that it was worth it. I can't say that. And I don't know if you noticed it, but when we came here in the clouds, it looked like they were eagle feathers, and his plane was the eagle. And there were eagles throughout his life. When I looked up and saw those, I went, hi, big guy. My son Nathan said, uh, when he was getting ready to go back shortly after Justin's funeral, um, I said to him, you know, 
be careful, you know, this can't happen again, something to that effect. And he said, Mother, God wouldn't do that to us twice. He wouldn't do it to us. Two type of evacuation platforms we have that are standard downrange right now. One is called the SCAD litter, which you see them putting them in right now. Uh -huh. And Better the other we have is your your basic litter. It's a quad folding litter called a talon right now. And once you treat a patient, your ability to get them to a higher level of care will, could de determine their outcome, whether they live or whether they die. These guys can stop the bleeding, they can get the airway open, they can decompress a tension pneumothorax, but for a definitive environment, he needs to go to a higher level of care. We're gonna find a safer building for our casualty. That safer building is up the way up there, but our only area to move through happens to go up this way. So we're gonna pick up our casualties, direction to travel feet first, head up that steep hill over here. These guys, when they go down range, they see very terrible things, probably more often than others. You remember everything as a medic. You remember how you treat somebody. You remember what they have. Everything you see, you remember. Een op de vijf soldaten die terugkeert uit de oorlog heeft te kampen met psychische problemen zoals posttraumatische stressstoornis. Gabriel Del Ferro diende 14 maanden als verpleger in Irak. Terug in Amerika laten de herinneringen aan de oorlog hem niet meer los en hij krijgt psychische problemen. Het leidt tot een scheiding van zijn vrouw en kinderen. After 9/11, I felt like it was my civic duty to be able to to serve the country, and it was the perfect timing for me. I was 30 years old. I'm 37 now, and I chose the medical field because um, it's something that I've always wanted to do. So I'm a medic in the army. My main specialty was with burns. Patients, burn patients, yes. And um, there's, there's one that I really remember the most, that it was my very first patient when I think the first week I was there. It was a three-year-old boy who was burnt, 80% burn on his body due to a IED blast and flash burns and what have you. And uh, he resembled my son Isaiah. Uh, and he was uh, three years old at that time, and the child was three years old. So being away from from my son, I kind of um, felt like it was my, you know, my duty to make sure this child survives and return him on, home to his family. I stayed up for 24 hours, doing everything I could to make sure this child survives. But um, my. NCOIC, which is the non-commissioned officer in charge, told me that I needed some sleep because my decision making was being altered due to lack of sleep. And upon waking up after three hours of sleep, the child was already dead. So that really hurt me a lot because I felt like if I just stayed up for a few more hours, maybe I could have done something. Did it really feel as a failure? Yes, I, I, I felt like I, I failed, and um, here it is, 2011, and I'm just barely learning to accept that there's some things in life that, regardless of what you do, the outcome is decided by someone greater than me. But how did you survive over there? In regards to that, um, I became numb. I, I, I learned to shut off my emotions and just treat patients as they come. But there's, there wasn't a night that I didn't go to sleep and pray for his family or himself. Yeah. During your whole deployment? Yes. 
and till today I still do. Helicopter to land now. We got a critical patient needs to get out of here. After you returned, what happened? It lasted about a year, almost two years, before anything relating to. Um, PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, really kicked in. I was going through a licensed practical nurse course, and I noticed that my um, my attention span wasn't there. And studying more de in depth in, in the medical field and the nursing side, you know, I started having flashbacks of the patients I took care of, and then of course that three-year-old child, came, his haunting memories came back. There was a few episodes where um, a lot of anger. Like for myself right now, I suffer from um, olfactory, which is your nasal, and bur smell of burnt flesh. I still have difficulties sometimes. You still smell burnt flesh? Uh, yes, and during the day I can function and work at the hospital, and that's no problem. But in the evenings when I'm sleeping, sometimes I have you know, nightmares, and I wake up to the scent of burnt flesh. Even five years later? Yes. I used to dream about him as if he's talking to me, you know. I, I say dream, but some people would consider it nightmares, as if he's talking to me. But I don't know if that's just my my subconscious, you know, because I'm holding on to it. And um, I had a revelation just last month to where my son's face is actually falling off of this child's face like slothing off due to the burn. I don't know if that's just my part of accepting that that wasn't my son at all. It was a, a child that was a casualty of war. Have you ever discussed this with your colleagues? A few of them, you know, in our training, we have to be mentally strong, physically fit. And um, I guess what I was going through, I felt like, you know, I'm failing again because I'm not being mentally strong. And in result, when you're not uh, motivated and you're going through depression your physical side is also you know dampered so I felt like I was undeserving of serving the country anymore you paid a high price for the freedom of the people of Iraq it took me away from my kids you know and in my mind I was gonna come back and everything you know for example I, I remember my kids a certain way and I was coming back to see the exact same thing, but they've moved on. In my mind, I paused my civilian life to serve overseas, expecting to come back to the exact same thing, and that didn't happen. And that was, uh, in a sense, a disappointment because I had expectations of it being the same, but they grow, regardless whether you're there or not, children grow. How difficult is it to talk about PTSD? Um, right now I feel a little bit comfortable, but I, I'm afraid that later on this evening when, you know, when I'm at my home, about to go to sleep, that I might have nightmares about it again. So that's this toll like I pay for sharing my story. It, the haunting memories come back. How do you view your future? Uncertain. I'm not sure. I'm hoping that I learn to accept because there's no way of me being able to, to delete those memories. There's no way of me being able to change what has happened. And I'm learning to accept that. And um, my point of view is I have to learn how to live with what I have versus trying to w find a way to get rid of it because it's going to be part of me for the rest of my life. And what I'd like to offer my children in the future is a better understanding of, of of what I went through. Do you prefer to stay in the army or? You know, if you asked me that, that question three months ago, I'd say yes. I, I, when I first got in, I wanted to make a career out of it. And today? And today I'm at the point in at pe being at peace to where saying I've done my service 
I'm grateful for my time, but I gotta find me, my life, and move forward. Hier in Colorado Springs liggen de dramatische verhalen letterlijk op straat. In de kroeg die ik net even bezocht, zat een jonge soldaat, volledig kapot, jankend achter zijn biertje. En ik vroeg wat er met hem aan de hand was. En hij zei dat hij een uur geleden gehoord had dat een goede vriend van hem in Kandahar, Afghanistan, is omgekomen. En hij vertelde zijn eigen verhaal. Een jaar terug uit Irak. In juni moet hij naar Afghanistan. Ik zeg, hoe is het met jou? Ik heb posttraumatische stress, zei hij. Zeg maar, als jij posttraumatische stress hebt, hoef jij toch niet naar Afghanistan? They don't care, zei hij. Zeg maar, jij dan? Nou ja, kan ik in ieder geval geld verdienen. Ik zal te begrijpen dat hij dat verhaal niet op camera wilde vertellen. Getraumatiseerde militairen kunnen in Colorado Springs terecht bij Aspen Point. Rich Lindsay werkt bij deze organisatie. ...die soldaten helpt bij de terugkeer in de Amerikaanse samenleving. Lindsay diende zelf ooit in Vietnam. Ik herinner me dat toen ik terugkwam in San Francisco op mijn terug van Vietnam... ...dat ik was advised om mijn uniform af te nemen... ...zodat mensen niet wisten dat ik in de militaire was... ...want mensen waren hostile. Er waren instances van mensen spitten op servicemembers... ...en hen them babykillers en al dat soort dingen. Het was een hostile environment. At the time. Hmm. And how would you compare that with, well, the current situation? There's much more support for the troops nowadays, you know. Um, even though I'd say that these current conflicts aren't popular, particularly with the American people, they're supporting the troops, and that's most important. Could you try to explain why so many soldiers have mental problems after they return from a war zone? Well, I think it's because of the experiences that they have in the combat zones and um, the loss of comrades and close buddies. And um, War is horrific at any time. So just based on the, the things that they see and experience there traumatize many of them. And how do these soldiers behave after they return from the war? Well, some of the ones that are experiencing PTSD or TBI um, sometimes have flashbacks of things that happened when they're in the war and uh, may do things that they wouldn't normally have done. Like? Like domestic violence, you know, or committing some crime like burglary or whatever. You know, I, I noticed that most of the, the veterans that I see who, you know, get in castle and they come back have never been in trouble before they deployed. Does the military recognize that, well, mental consequences are directly related to the deployment of soldiers to a war? Oh, I, I think that in comparison to the era, the Vietnam era when I served, um, that the military is much more aware of these type of problems and their causes and are trying to do all that they can to address them. Of course, um, I think that the military is overwhelmed with the, the number of these uh, types of issues. But they're certainly doing all they can to address them now. But if you, for instance, suffer from P PTSD or if you recognize some symptoms, um, is there still a quite strong hesitation to seek mental health care? I think, I think that there is, which I can sort of understand. I mean, if you um, really love the military, you want to stay, and you don't want to do anything that's going to... Uh, have an impact so harsh that you wouldn't be allowed to stay in the military. So I, I can understand the hesit hesitancy to seek, you know, mental health care or mm. any other kind of care they might need. Is it but a part of the reality that seeking for mental health care, well, 
would negatively impact your career? But it was always that way in the past, but I think that I think that it's getting much better, and I think that now the military is encouraging, you know, their their people to to talk about these issues and to seek the care that they need, or even direct them to get it if necessary. Toch is de stap om psychische hulp te zoeken voor veel militairen nog steeds te groot. De afgelopen vijf jaar pleegden 675 Amerikaanse militairen zelfmoord. De zoon van Catherine Eastburn diende in Irak. Terug in Amerika slaagde hij er niet in zijn leven weer op orde te krijgen. This is our shrine to Ted. Um, Obviously, with you know a lot of his uh, memorabilia from Iraq. Um, this was the flag that the government gave us at his service, and uh, here's a photograph of him when he was serving in Iraq. These are all photographs of him as well. How long has he served in Iraq? About six months in the special operations. And uh, he went in the winter of 2005 and came back in the spring of 2006. And he died in 2007. He was very quiet and uh, almost secretive about what he did in Iraq. Honestly, I don't really even know. Um, so. That must have been difficult. Very difficult, very difficult. He was not allowed to speak about his job. Right. He was in a unit that does in what's called psyops, psychological operations, which the more I think about it, the more I just think it's insane to have such young people doing that, you know, who were, are just becoming men themselves. And basically, they're trained to mess with people's heads. He, he wasn't able to talk about these things. His father and I both recommended that he get help, that he go and talk to someone, and um, he told us, I can't do that, because if I do, I'll lose my job. I just thought, that can't possibly be true. But when I spoke to a psychiatrist and a psychologist, you know, here in town, and said, after he died, and said, you know, my son told me that he would lose his job if he went and talked with someone about his problems, and they said, that's absolutely true. That was absolutely true at the time. And I think that's changing, because there's been a huge public outcry about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, um, anxiety disorders, all kinds of psych psychological injuries among soldiers. And at that time, uh, when you came back, you filled out a multiple choice form. They sent it to you in the mail. Do you have problems sleeping? No. Are you having any problems with anxiety? No. Are you having hallucinations? No. Of course, you, you fill out no, 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 no. You put it in the mail and you send it back. He believed that he would save people's lives. He really believed that he would, you know, join the army and go somewhere and be a hero and save people's lives. So, and I opposed the war. Um, I did which, not. Which one? The Iraq war, the war on terrorism, the, the, the ill-founded, war in my mind. I, I opposed the war and uh, I certainly didn't want uh, my child to be fighting it, but he was in the army and that was his choice. And so we disagreed about that, but I respected his decision mm -hmm. and he knew that I respected his decision. He also knew that I opposed the war. We, I think we go to war far too easily. How important is this place to you? Very important. This was where uh, Ted's memorial service was held. And uh, let's see, 
I guess there were probably a thousand people here. A thousand? Mm-hmm. Uh, all of Ted's, uh, lots of military people, uh, lots of friends with full military, you know, the salute with the guns and, you know, the whole bit. So it was a beautiful service. I haven't been here since my son's memorial service. Really? Actually. No. First time? Yep. It's not quite four years ago when he died. Um, so, you know, I've been through lots and lots and lots of emotions. Um, right now, you know, being here, um, I don't know. I feel regret that he's gone, you know, just regret that he was in such pain in his life that he chose to end it. And that's what this reminds me of. That's what this reminds me of. You told me Ted had a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that? Well, I mean, it's the only conclusion I can come to. I think that's why people end their lives, is because they can't, can't abide the pain they're living in. Um, I, I what, think what happened to him? He shot himself. He, he shot himself in the head with a handgun. Did he suffer from a certain kind of post-traumatic stress disorder? I believe it was certainly associated with his service in Iraq. Um, I say that because I noticed a dramatic change in his personality when he returned from Iraq. Um, he was more withdrawn. He, he was full of rage, un, undirected rage. Um, if you tried to get to the bottom of it and say, what are you so angry about? Who are you angry with? It was, you know, everybody, <laughs> everything. He was filled with rage when he came back from this war. Was PTSD still a taboo at that time? Uh, it still was a mystery. It still was not very well known. It still, it wasn't, if you said PTSD, in 2007, far few, you know, not as many people would know what you were talking about as, as do now. Right? It's much better known now, uh, even just three and a half, four years later. Um, it was still pretty much of a, not something people talked about much then. Ted committed suicide. Would you consider him a victim of the war? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, there was a major who came to Ted's uh, memorial service and spoke. And he said, make no mistake, Ted is a casualty of this war. And uh, it was helpful to me to hear him say that. It was very helpful to me to hear him say that. It was heartbreaking, but it was also affirming uh, to me that uh, the war experience definitely had an impact, had a huge impact on him. Speciaal voor militairen die wel psychische steun zoeken, is er in Colorado Springs een cursus creatieve therapie opgezet. Schilderen als uitlaatklep voor de verschrikkingen van de oorlog. What are you going to paint today? Well, right now the only image that I have in my head is, um, of course, just, you know, sun setting, kind of closing out the day. And um, I was going to have an image of a guy holding a child. We'll see how that goes. Sometimes I have the image in my head and it works out, sometimes it doesn't. So this painting is directly related to the story you told us 
about is from the old boy. And his this is, a, I guess, a combination of how I'm just honoring mm -hmm. the child. And why is sunset and not the sunrise? Sunset is a closure. But if you're talking about a closure, does it mean that you're Accepting. more or less well, and more or less at the end of the circle? Um, no, not so much. I think it's just me accepting, learning to accept that, that I did my part, the best of my ability with my training and the knowledge that I have. And that, that's all I, that, that is asked of me. I'm not a god I can't create, you know, I can't stop death from arising, you know. There's more to life than allowing yourself to be burned by guilt and carrying that load. It's, 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 it's a heavy burden. And I've carried it long enough. <laughs> During our conversation, you were wondering mm -hmm. how you would sleep that night. I, I was actually at peace. I think it's because I'm, I'm sharing my experience and that I'm learning from it and, you know, growing. So it's it's a part of the healing process where I can talk about it without reliving it as if it would just happen yesterday. Well, that's nice to hear. Yeah. And it's taken me, the, you know, so many years to get there, you know, to get where I'm at right now. So.